All right. Uh, I'm just going to introduce uh, the person who is going to do the next panel. Um, the panel title is Yakiga Alamode, Bearing Yoshimoto, Comics and Men's Fashion. And doing this panel will be uh, an expert on manga, Ryan Holberg. He is a visiting associate professor at the University of Tokyo. As a manga historian, he is a frequent contributor to the Comics Journal and has edited and translated numerous books from publishers including Drawn and Corley, Picture Box, Breakdown Press, and Retrofit Big Planet Comics. And so let me bring up to do this panel, Ryan Holmberg. How long should I talk for? A quarter after. Uh, let's see. So it's 4.30, so... There's one after this, right? Yeah, so at 5.15, you can open up the questions okay. and wrap it up around 5.25. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, thanks, Rob. <clears throat> and thanks for SP SPX for having me again this year. Um, today, I want to talk in support of a book uh, that recently came out called The Troublemakers. It's from Retrofit Comics. I have a copy in my bag. I forgot to get it here. But there's copies for sale at the retrofit table um, upstairs. It's a book by an artist named Baron Yoshimoto, who was fairly big in Japanese comics up until the early 80s, and then was forgotten, and then has kind of been revived again in Japan, uh, less through his comics and more through his illustration and painting work. He's been doing paintings for major Japanese temples in Kyoto, been doing some painting exhibitions, and I'm told we'll be doing a painting exhibition potentially uh, either in New York or LA uh, next year. And the reason that came about is actually because Retrofit put the troublemakers out and people now are starting to know who Baron Yoshimoto um, is. Now Baron Yoshimoto is known as a Gekiga artist, but he's a special kind of Gekiga artist. Um, a lot of the books that I have done have been about different types of Gekiga. I know when the Gekiga kind of boomed as a buzzword about, what was that, 15 years ago, it was associated with one name, Tatsumi Yoshihiro, um, who, the guy who also coined the name of the term. Um, but it has been elaborated by a lot of different artists in a different way. Uh, artists associated with the experimental mag magazine Garo, like Hayashi Seichi, who was interested in kind of cinematics in comics, but also amplifying the speed lines that be had become uh, kind of a facet, essential facet of Gekiga. Um, an artist who used another word, Komaga, uh, was a contemporary of Tatsumi, who was interested in using kind of cinematic angles in a mystery uh, format. A uh, book, uh, my book that most recently came out, uh, Tada Otsuge, uh, Slum Wolf. Um, artists interested, like many Gekiga artists, as the term is known in the United States, dealing with the underclass and uh, hardships after World War II in Japan. Uh, or an artist like Katsumata Susumu, who is also a Garo contributor who started doing extremely uh, abstract literary short form Gekiga um, <clears throat> for Garo in magazines like Calm in the 1980s, uh, in the 70s and 80s, and his work is represented by two collections in English, uh, Red Snow from Drawn and Quarterly, and then Fukushima Devilfish that came out this year um, from uh, Breakdown Press in London. Um, so Baron Yoshimoto's book, uh, this was not my idea, actually. This was the first time an artist, actually his daughter, pitched a book to me. Uh, I knew his work uh, vaguely, uh, and I kind of took it on without thinking. It became a big project and a very enjoyable and um, educational project for me. And what I was interested, became interested about in Baron was actually not only the subject matter, what you're seeing on the left is a story that's in Troublemakers about... Uh, immigrant Koreans in Japan being mistreated during World War II. And then some of the other stories are probably in contemporary view would be seen as at least mildly sexist uh, sexploitation stories. And I wanted to like, kind of create a mix of Baron as both someone who is doing progressive political things and historical things, but also is catering in a kind of intelligent and knowing way to men's taste in the 1970s. Now, he is best known for a, a series called Jukyoden, uh, Judo Tales of Chivalry. Uh, it became a big hit. It end, ended up going f different, uh, <clears throat> different versions, went for about 10 years and about 10,000 pages. The original Jukyoden was about 1,000 pages. Um, 
Um, it's a story kind of based on late 19th century uh, novels about how to be a strong man in militarizing, modernizing Japan. Judo was seen as a kind of a way to, for young men to achieve that. And he wrote a story, uh, Jukyo then was kind of set um, in this period, kind of reviving that model for uh, manga in the 70s. And Baron Yoshimoto, uh, not only a fast and very uh, accomplished artist at the, at the level of drawing and storytelling, but he also had an eye for historical detail. He researched a lot, and he had a real detail for clothing and period fashion. And that's something I want to talk about today. And it's kind of outside of my field. I know very little about fashion. Me wearing a button-up shirt is kind of a rare thing. Um, so I'm kind of out, <clears throat> out in the wild for myself in this. But what's interesting about Baron Yoshimoto is that before he got into manga, he wanted to become a illustrator. And he went in the early 1960s to a fashion illustration academy located in Aoyama, in the center of Tokyo, kind of the fashion district, called the uh, uh, Setsu Mode Seminar. And what you're seeing on the left is a fashion illustration um, that uh, Baron made in uh, 1960. And on the right, you can see the original drawing for the cover of Troublemakers, that some of this posing, right, is interest in fashion, is interested in kind of weird angles and weird, slightly uh, convoluted body postures, probably comes out of his interest in uh, fashion illustration. And I'm going to show how this plays out in Gekiga of the 90s, Gekiga of the 60s and 70s. And it represents a very different idea about what Gekiga was. Because usually we think about it as gritty men in gritty situations, underclass, um, acting out uh, fairly aggressive uh, sexual traumas or fantasies um, in different ways, right? But Baron had that in him, but he was also interested in kind of a new thing in Japan, which was. Uh, men's fashion, and men's fashion in Japan was also connected to a, a new readership in Japan. This idea is a word in Japanese called seinen, which means young male adult. And the idea is that there's a new market, right? There's this, this is like adolescence. There's this type of manhood that's between boyhood and full manhood, like the, the older boy who's in his, his late teens, early 20s. More Japanese are going to university at this point, until the late 1950s, it was rare for anyone to go, rare for people to go on to university. But this idea that you had this kind of delayed adulthood into your early 20s. And also, Japan is becoming more affluent, and therefore men and women have more uh, money to spend on what would have been seen as an older generation as frivolities, like fancy clothing. So Baron's Gekiga kind of plays into this, right? Now, catering to this new seinen young male adult audience were the number of magazines, seinen uh, magazines in the mid-1960s. They really start proliferating around 1964 and 1967. And by the, late, by the late 60s, they become kind of a norm. Right? So here you have a famous one called Heibon Punch on the left, the first issue. Right? And it's not, what's interesting here is not only uh, the fashion, which at the time in Japan would have been known as the ivy look, there's a number of photo collections by, I can't remember, there's a photographer, fashion photographer named Hayashida who did a famous book in the mid 60s called The Ivy Look in Japan. And it kind of set off a fashion boom of dressing what they thought was Ivy League look um, in Japan, right? But what's interesting here you'll notice is that the men are also dark skinned, right? And a lot of these magazines were also interested in American culture but also black culture um, in the United States. Right? And on the right, you have a early manga magazine by Hobunsha uh, that's catering to this new seinen audience. And it's a mix of humor comics, um, gekiga type comics, uh, but also weird things that have been, that had a life about three years and then totally vanished from Japanese comics history. Um, these weird mishmashes of American humor comics, especially influenced by Mad and Playboy, adapted to uh, some Japanese sensibilities, but sometimes the Japanese sensibilities are so washed out in the beginning that they just look like copycats of what you find in American magazines. This is Ishihara Gojin, who is better known as an illustrator. He did a number of uh, very realistic homoerotic illustrations in the 1950s and 60s, I believe. He was also active as a manga artist, working in many styles. Um, this is a work, you can see the titles even in English, right? It's called uh, The Miami Caper. And this was in Heibon Punch, that men's fashion and news magazine, right? 
So you have artists, Japanese artists, kind of mimicking uh, American uh, screwball and playboy humor at the time. This is also the age that pop art takes, in, uh, takes off in Japan. Yoko Tadanori, who went on to become a famous uh, poster and book and illustration designer, uh, did a, a film called Kiss in 1964, Kiss, Kiss, Kiss. Not so much interested in American comics, per se, as uh, how American comics were processed through American pop artists like Roy Lichtenstein. Uh, Tanami Keiichi, who's well known as a psychedelic designer, was also interested in uh, American comics via kind of the camp boom, Batman and Wonder Woman, in the mid-1960s, doing uh, mixed comics experimental illustration. Uh, artists who are better known as, in the art world, uh, action painter and happenings artist uh, Shinohara Ushio, did giant murals uh, based on comics that he found in Japanese comic books, uh, uh, Japanese bookstores, in this case, Batman and Teen Titans. And then also artists were, Japanese manga artists were also caught up in this pop boom. Like Hayashi Seichi was doing uh, works like this uh, for Garo. This is in translation in a book called Red Red Rock. And then magazines that were coming out from bigger publishers like Futabasha um, were also trying to mix this kind of American pop sensibility and older Japanese gekiga sensibilities to create a new kind of comics uh, magazine in Japan for young men. Um, the best known is a magazine that's still around called Manga Action. And Manga Action's uh, most famous artist is an artist that many of you probably know uh, named Monkey Punch. His name was Monkey Punch because punch is an old word for cartoons in Japan imported from the West. And monkey is like aping. So his name means he's aping American comics, Monkey Punch. It was, very, it was a very knowing thing that he did, right? And what this meant was, you know, you have these long-legged, busty girls, and you have these guys, these playboy spies, who, uh, you know, when they're not shooting and chasing, they're basically drooling over these busty girls, right? It's that kind of action uh, situation. Um, or artists like Kasama Shiro, and a lot of these artists, Kasama Shiro went on to, to become a very famous uh, pornographic manga artist in the 1970s. He was doing uh, comics like this um, in the late 1960s for seinen manga magazines. And very obviously these artists were looking at things like MAD, uh, especially uh, influential for the work of Monkey Punch was the work of Mort Drucker. And here you have a 007 parody. And in Japanese magazines, you'll find that they were doing uh, parodies of Napoleon Solo, a British uh, spy adventure, also of James Bond, right? And here you have juxtaposed Mort Drucker's drawings with the appearance of Sean Connery in one of the episodes of Lupin the Third from Monkey Punch. <clears throat> now, Baron Yoshimoto was also caught up in this. Um, his first stories for Futabasha, he didn't call them manga or gekiga, he called them action illu stories, as you see top right. And they were, in what in his mind, represented American comics at the time, right? This is 1967. I don't think many American comics looked like this in 1967. My knowledge of American comics is not very good. Maybe you guys can tell me what kind of American comics he was looking at. But it, doing stories like this, kind of mixed romance spy um, stories, usually only 8, 10, 12 pages long. Parodies of uh, the Vietnam War. Here's called the, Viet, the Pantherist of the Viet Cong. This is in Manga Story, the magazine that was readapted as Manga Action a couple years later. He was also doing westerns, like you see on the left, and more spy things, like you see um, on the right. And Baron Yoshimoto, until this time, his name was Yoshimoto Tadashi, and a lot of editors at the time des decided that these Americanized, anglicized artists needed anglicized, Americanized names. So a lot of times artists just gave them new names without asking. So Baron Yoshimoto Tadashi became Baron Yoshimoto, uh, Monkey Punch, what was his name? I can't remember what his original name was. Kato Kazuhiko. He became Monkey Punch. Um, Kasama Shiro, I think his, originally he was called Don Shibuya, like after a gangster. So all these artists were just randomly given these, what Japanese editors thought were American sounding names. Now in 1968, Tatsumi Yoshihiro publishes a book, it's kind of a manifest about what is Gekiga. Because this was his idea back in the early, late 50s, and he saw it as being taken over by the culture industry and made into something that wasn't his. So he published a book in the late 1960s called Gekiga College to tell you exactly what Gekiga should have been. It was always originally supposed to be. 
And then, but Monkey Punch had become famous very fast, so he did his own kind of counter book. It's called Komiku Numon, uh, intro to comics, right? And if you can read Japanese, the word is komiku, right? So they're using the word comics from English. And the thesis in Monkey Punch's book, it's very interesting, is that actually at this point, Gekiga had become very stale and it needed to renew itself. It needed to renew itself for a more affluent age of the late 60s. And what he thought it was, what Gekiga needed to be, he, did, he thought Gekiga needed to be more manga-like. Now, of course, if you read some about Tatsumi, Tatsuma, he, Tatsumi was against the idea of what manga represented. It, meant, it, meant, it represented frivolous, humorous things for kids. He wanted things that were more serious, more about real life. Right? He didn't want to do Tezuka, what Tezuka was doing, even though he respected Tezuka. Now, Monkey Punch says, actually, what Gekiga needs at this point what mature manga needs at this point is more manga-esque qualities. And how they was going to get those manga-esque qualities, that humor, humor, was by looking at American comics, right? So initially, there's kind of a history phase happens that these artists import kind of American humor and comic book stylization. And then by the early 70s, to kind of clean that out, right? To be, make that importation more Japanese-like. Well, this is just uh, showing you what kind of uh, Tatsumi now, <clears throat> who was the bad Gekiga artist in the 1960s? It was the, also the most famous Gekiga artist, Saito Takao, who did Gogo 13. A lot of the critics that were around Tatsumi in the magazine Gato thought Saito Takao represented the worst of what happened to uh, rental book culture in the 1950s. It was basically kind of mass producing action comics, right? And Saito Takao stuff is interesting, but there's, there's a ton of it. Right? It's all about the same kind of heroes, same kind of plot stories. He was self-publishing a lot. You see he was working a lot of different genres, westerns, uh, mystery, uh, samurai, ninja, etc. But what's, what, what's one thing that's interesting about Saito Takao's work, and it's important for understanding Baron Yoshimoto, is that he was the first artist to get Gekiga style into mass print magazines. He was hired by a magazine called Boy's Life in, I think, 1964 to do a adaptation of 007. At the same time, he was working for other magazines doing short, uh, kind of erotic spy stories, also for an uh, adult audience. And what's interesting also about this is not only that he was adapting Gekiga for a slightly older male audience, but that's also, he was really interested in clothing, right? Interested in fashion. Like whenever a guy shoots his gun, he's got to look good while he's shooting it, right? Now, he was kind of pulling out something that was already in Gekiga culture, back in the era of Kashihon manga and rental culture, which is a kind of a performative aspect with genre, right? A lot of mystery, a lot of spy, a lot of action comics in early Gekiga work. And a lot of the artists who were making this, people that were involved with the Gekiga studio, Tatsumi's group, also kind of got into it on a personal level. They did a lot of what would be known now as cosplay, right? Costume play for themselves and going out. Like Sato Masaki, one of the major artists of uh, the Gekiga studio. Not only was he doing hardboiled action comics, but he was also dressing up. He would buy toy guns. He had a huge collection of toy guns. He had a huge collection of, of outfits modeled on uh, <clears throat> you know, Hitchcock, American gangster films, etc. And even Tatsumi, too, he started doing a boxing manga series. At the same time, he took up boxing. So in each manga, there would also be a, a bit about how Tatsumi's boxing career is coming along, right? So a lot of these Gekiga artists, uh, working in a genre that we think about dealing with the real, they knew that what they were doing was very performative and about codes within a genre, right? Now, Baron Yoshimoto, he debuts, I think, in, as a Gekiga artist in the mid-60s, um, was also doing similar things. This is a book called um, Order to Kill. Um, and you see where he puts his, he's working in kind of a saito s style, really exaggerated action with exaggerated speed lines, right? And he's also obsessed with a certain degree of realistic detail, of course, in a venue that you would expect out of men's action comics in guns, right? Whole two pages about how to assemble this gun. And a lot of these magazines would have had advertising for toy guns, model guns. And he was also interested in kind of adapting popular playboy characters. In this case, Sean Connery appears in his manga as a bad guy, right? But he's also very interested in Japanese becoming interested in American and Western culture. Here on the left, this is the, the main guy and his lover. And on the left, you have his whole page where she 
bitches about how hard it is to learn English. She's like gone to Cam she's an actress, but become a, a world class actress. She has to learn English, so she goes to I think England and studies with a Cambridge professor, and she complains about how the Cambridge professor just has her parrot English off a tape recorder all day, right? And at the end, she says, I could only do it because of you, darling, kind of thing. So there's a whole page of an action comics about the character, how do they learn English, right? And then at the end of the book, you have Baron talking about how he got into comics, uh, how he got into manga. He read Popeye. He read Classics Illustrated. Um, he read Kashihon Manga. And then at the end, he has this small tutorial about how to draw comics in an American style. And this is 1967, right? This is kind of a weird concept about how to draw American comics in 1967, right? So this is what it looks like. What, what are the features of American comics? Big square faces and jaws, right? Weird panel formations, lots of sharp angles, oblique angles, right? Men in suits and hats, right? American sound effects. Uh, writing that goes uh, horizontal. And then a lot of text to the side, right? And then like what in Japan would have been known as like a 3D element, the cans coming out of panels, stuff like this. And at the very end after this, Baron Yoshimoto says, let's not, let's not be parochial. Japan has become a global economic power by the late 1960s. It's going to become second to the US soon. Therefore, Japan should not be mired in Japanese-ness, right? We should become more international and global in style. And for him, that was by adopting Western forms, right? On the bottom, he says, Japan should have a frontier spirit. And you see he's uh, dressed like Daniel Boone or something, right? Now, one of the earliest things, it's interesting, one of the earliest experiments that Baron did in this, what he called American-style work, was not for a manga magazine, but for a fashion magazine called Men's Club. It's this two-part series that apparently wasn't successful because it ended after two parts, uh, 12 pages, I think, each. Yet another Playboy uh, action story, right? <clears throat> and it's a collaboration with someone. What's interesting is not, the story itself is not interesting whatsoever, right? And the, this is the kind of imagery he was doing for this, right? Men's magazines, this kind of men's magazine was not doing, this, in this magazine, this is the only comics they had. They had short Humor comics, maybe one strip or one page. But in terms of multi-paneled, multi-page, multi-paneled uh, story comics, this is the only experiment they did. And they didn't do it because they were interested in comics per se, but they did it because they were interested in what comics provided in terms of posing bodies, and especially men's bodies, right? And what American comics offered in terms of offering a new type of masculinity via clothes and hairstyle and whatnot. And comics, basically, you can think about it, you know, because it's a series of panels, it's also a series of postures, of bodily postures, right? So I think that's what the fashion magazines were tapping in at the time. Now, his collaborator on this, who I believe wrote, I don't know what his role was exactly. I think he had it kind of advised on uh, the story a little bit and then uh, some of the postures. Hosumi Kazuo is fairly well known in Japan. He's, he's known as an illustrator of this kind of stuff. He's still active today. And he's known as like a, the, the visual, main visualizer and illustration of the so-called Ivy look in Japan. So Baron Yoshimoto, this young and not very well-known Gekiga artist, is being teamed up with one of the major fashion theorists and illustrators at the time. And Hosei, one of his most famous books is this. It's called To Dress or Be Dressed. And it's an interesting book because it sets out to be a manifesto about arguing for high men's fashion, right? And his ideal, he had this ide word, oshare, which is a typical word in Japanese. It means uh, fashionableness or fanciness. And it's a word that you usually associate with women and how they uh, demonstrate femininity through clothes and accoutrements, right? But he is saying that men also need to be oshare. So I just have a quick uh, passage here. He says, not only is men's oshare not to be taken lightly, it is a matter of the greatest importance for any man who hopes to take on the world on his own. The making, choosing, and wearing of clothes must be approached with the same determined faith and focus that you apply to your work in private life. To put it extremely, oshare is, in a sense, an expression of a man's worldview and philosophy. Thus, a man who has no interest in, in oshare is a man with absolutely zero appeal as a human being and a man in whom I can place no trust. Men must be Oshare. And how he showed Oshare was not just through text about 
tips about how to dress, but he also had these illustrations that show the details of how to dress. Now, you can see some of this also in Baron's work. I mentioned before he had a background in illustration, but even in his work, you can see that there's details of fashion. I'll use this example a couple times. It's another uh, story of no significance, a uh, book that he did in the mid-1960s. Uh, I'm interested in how he like, demonstrates you know, men's bodies and bodies through clothing, right? So in this book, this is the front, the title page, right? And here you have on the right, things that you wouldn't necessarily find usually in men's comics or gekiga from the time. You have the heroine with big eyes, glistening eyes, right? And then she's in this very elaborate kimono, right? He's paid a lot of attention to the details of the textile pattern. And the left, the hero, who also has big, you know, glittering eyes, right? And in the story, you have these panels that, like on the far right panel I'm interested in, it's like, it sets that this man is dancing with this woman, but it's really about her dress, right? You have these full panels that are more about the texture of clothing. Or that, you know, when the, after the guy has an action, he turns around with this big grinning smile and these big beautiful eyes, right? It's about showing, a, a kind of, of <clears throat> showing his manliness, but in codes that traditionally wouldn't have been associated with men's manga at the time, right? So you have... Baron Bar Yoshimoto kind of like importing things that we would associate maybe with BL manga or shoujo manga, but probably also through that, also through the shoujo manga, but mainly through his background in fashion, right? So here two guys are fighting, and after they're done beating up the guys, they look at it something with, you know, something more than just manly um, uh, co recognition, right? There's something else going on. Now, as I said, Baron was trained as a fashion illustrator at something called the Setsumode Seminar, which is a famous, uh, recently closed, but it's a famous uh, fashion illustration school. And there they did <clears throat> these kind of uh, style uh, sketches, right? The guy who ran it, Nagasawa Setsu, was into this kind of sketching that everyone would stand around a model and walk around and show them in different poses. And you can see this is from his sketchbooks and many uh, tutorial books, which are bestsellers on the left. And you can see on the right that Baron is using some, some of the same poses, right? Like look on the left and look on the right. It's basically the same pose from two different angles, right? And a very awkward thing, right? Sh throwing your jacket over like this and then smoking a cigarette. Very unnatural poses. Now, in Japanese, this kind of images, what I was just showing on the left, are known as style pictures, staiduga. And they're associated as one of the major features of shoujo manga, right? You have these stories that suddenly break, the story stops, and suddenly you have the, the main character in nice dress, full-bodied, right? It's not about, it's about kind of like her persona expressed through um, her persona and her hopes. Meanwhile, also uh, demonstrating uh, clothing, right? This is a very typical thing in shoujo manga, right? You see it in shoujo manga through the 50s and 60s, even to the period um, up when Baron is creating, right? Whole, on the left, you have whole sections that are about how to make style pictures, right? And then basically, Baron is doing kind of like style pictures inside Gekiga, which is kind of an interesting thing. It's kind of a crossing of gender tropes and codes within Gekiga that a lot of people don't talk about. And I look at this, like this pose, right? I mean, it's kind of like that, po that sets, Nagasawa sets a pose on the left, but imagine trying to do this pose, just bodily trying to do it. It's like impossible to, to do this, right, while your hand's back in your, in your pocket, right? And also notice like the shoe, right? It's like you see the bottom of the tread and it also has like the, the details of the stitching. Now this is a story about a castaway who eventually goes all the way to the Middle East to help uh, beat terrorists. And, uh, and occasionally in this story when he pops up, he pops up in these Saiduga pictures is images, right? And he's a stowaway, but this is pretty hot fashion from, for the 19, 1966, right? And then he arrives in Kuwait and is about to attack the, per attack the uh, terrorists and against the Kuwaiti pipelines, he shows up like this, right? <laughs> right? And there's like, I think this check plaid was kind of associated with Ivy style time. And he's got a watch, right? Like the, like the watch and these shoes. This isn't, this isn't the typical outfit for an action character in Gekiga until this moment. Right, and at the end of the comics, the same one, Baron does this little caricature of himself about himself in, I, in the ivy mode, the ivy look, and he's showing what things he's bought recently, what kind of neck, tin, neck tie pins, etc. Right, <clears throat> this is kind of the, the style he was going for at the time. <clears throat> 
And apparently when he first started getting into magazine work, uh, magazine publishers hated him because he showed up in these, these like suits and everyone thought he was really kind of gross and annoying. Um, but eventually because of the rise of these ma fashion, fashion magazines, seinen magazines, he found a kind of a context for this kind of masculine performativity through fashion. Or here's another one on the right, you know, Lee Jeans. I think it's probably a pretty rare thing in 1966 in Japan, right? What, what does that pose, this? It's like to show off, show off the, the patches on his jacket and the stitching. And then on the left, you can see like the stitching of the jacket, right? And on the bottom left, it describes the character. And what it, one thing it says at the end, it says, his favorite things are sushi. And he has a weakness for uh, alcohol, kindness, and neckties. Why neckties, right? <laughs> Now, another thing that's interesting about this is it introduces a new type of male physiognomy uh, within manga, right? We usually, Tezuka style is kind of these compacted spheres. Things get a little bit more naturalistic and elongated with Tatsumi and Saito Takao's work. But Bottom starts working in this really elongated, impossibly elongated style in the uh, late 1960s. And Monkey Punch was doing the same thing, right? And it's based off kind of Western physiognomies. But his teacher, uh, Nagasawa Setsu, was also, he believed skinny bodies were beautiful. He thought skinny bodies had a functional beauty to them, like functional beauty like an aircraft has a functional beauty. And what the functional beauty of skinny bodies was is that you could see the joints and the wrists. You could see how the body was put together and how it moved. So you, now you have this manga physiognomy that's not based on you know, torsos and hands and limbs, right? Or faces. It's based on joints and long limbs, right? So you have Baron kind of making, his style changes very rapidly in the course of the late 60s. He starts making these works. This one's set initially in Watts in LA. Um, it's uh, about this convict, these two convicts that escape and they have to fight the KKK and then the American government. Uh, so the setting is in the United States. The style is kind of derived from Western physiognomies. Right? You have English in the title. Some of the open line work, which you see very typically in seinen manga, was probably influenced by illustrators and poster designers like uh, Bob Peake, um, people who are doing posters for James Bond and uh, what else? Uh, that kind of stuff, right? And then Baron was also shifting genres from action to kind of social realist stuff. He also did a number of westerns. Here you see a work uh, called The Two-Eyed Hyena. And if Troublemakers does well, I want to do a translation of, of this. This would be uh, pretty easy to do. Uh, right size, 200, 300 pages. So it's about this uh, uh, gunslinger um, in the American West, right? And here you see that these kind of joint-based functional beauty skinny bodies are kind of the basis uh, for action in these comics and also for demonstrating uh, uh, fashion. You know, we think of Westerns in different ways. But you know, one thing Westerns are is a huge costume display. Right. And I'll show you at the end a picture in which Baron takes this costume display very uh, seriously. Right. Here's kind of work. There's some other pages from Baron Yoshimoto's uh, Westerns. Same one. Or like this. And it's interesting that right after Baron, like many of the artists, started... Um, they had, there was a small period of about three or four years, and when they were doing this work that the Japanese would call buttery, and buttery means too American, like kind of cloing, too cloingly Western. It's trying too hard to be Western, right? He, everyone has this period. A lot of the artists keep trying to do it in the 1970s and become criticized and not able to find jobs in it. But Baron starts Japanizing his work in different ways in the late, right around 1970. Uh, the uh, first work that he did in this way uh, was a series based on research into Japanese, different forms of Japanese gambling. Uh, he would go to pachinko parlors and bike tracks, uh, bicycle tracks, uh, but he would also go into Yakuza uh, dice dens, uh, card dens. Um, had some pretty close calls, he tells me, from with the Yakuza at the time. Um, he kind of hi had to hide his identity uh, so they didn't know that he was scoping while he was there betting. And at this point, Gato's making a lot of money. He has a number of, of assistants. He's still making a lot of money off a number of serializations. But he said uh, in these years, he basically became, uh, there's a saying, I don't know if it's a saying in English too, but in Japanese, the, the mummy hunter becomes the mummy, right? That 
he got addicted to gambling and basically blew all the money he had on research by gambling all the time. Right? And after this, he does Jukyoden, kind of the ultra Japanese judo manga. Right? But at the same time, Baron Yoshimoto, every morning when he leaves the house, he puts on something like this. Uh, I've met him. This is the first time I met him. He showed up at a meeting like this, not because I'm from the United States, but because he dresses like this on most days. And sometimes he he's also has a black belt in judo, and sometimes he, he leaves the house wearing a judo outfit. But here you have him with this sheriff badge and this bolo tie, and uh, you can't see it, but his 10-gallon hat. Right? So Baron Yoshimoto kind of cleared out his butteriness for a while to do a kind of a, become a famous Gekiga artist. And then the, what's interesting is in the early 1980s, he started pitching to American comics publishers, and his only published gig was he, did, he drew one episode of Savage Sword of Conan um, in the early 1980s, and then did a number of illustrations for Penthouse Forum in the late uh, 1980s. And also in the early uh, 80s in Japan, there was a magazine called Popcorn, uh, and it was kind of an early attempt in Japan uh, within the comics industry to do mixed American and Japanese content. There was translated uh, Fantastic Four, Hulk, X-Men, and then Japanese artists doing kind of American-ish uh, work. And Baron did one called Lone Fist, is a kung fu, um, kind of a Bruce Lee-like kung fu thing done in what he thought was an American style. So he's had this kind of ping-ponging effect going back from a Japanese style to different type, experimenting with American style in different ways. So that's my talk, and uh, at least I hope it interests you in kind of these other aspects of Gekiga, that Gekiga wasn't all, all about dark male desires and frust uh, frustrations and castration anxieties, but was also kind of tied into dip pop culture in different ways uh, as early as the mid-1960s. So thank you. Any questions? Comments? Yeah? I, I think I have to ask just because, um, you know, so I have so many questions, but mostly um, what's so fascinating about this, aside from not knowing that he had any kind of schooling in fashion illustration, is that a lot of that, um, a lot of those fashion illustrators and designers, you know, evolved into a completely different format of magazine publishing to now, like, you know, Ivy style and Van and, yeah. you know, um, Kusumi especially, but they all kind of went in the direction of, like, Brutus and Popeye mm -hmm. and more Tweety and, like, yeah. more sort of buttoned up, whereas he clearly has gone into, like, his own sort of masculine <laughs> uniform universe, but, um, I know that in the context of, for example, game manga, the costumery and, you know, it's a fetish. It's right. a specific look that codes a certain fetish. But do you know if this actually, you know, with fashion illustrators, it has a direct response. It's reactive and proactive. Like, people actually start dressing the way mm -hmm. that the magazines tell you to. Yeah. I, I wonder how much of this work is actually affecting you know, clothing, like actual yeah. fashion practice or, you know, if he feels like he's had effect on actual fashion. Right. Um, I don't know. I haven't asked him. I mean, you know, it's like, like in boys' magazines, like Shonen Manga, also Shoujo Manga, it's like they're, you know, those magazines are supported a lot by advertising. A lot of times the advertising is toys and costume elements that match with what the characters are wearing. And there it's very much fantasy, right? It's like, whatever, dress like a soldier or dress like a robot or a Atomo or whatever. Which also causes yeah. an enormous amount of anxiety socially. Yeah. Right? He is dressing like American soldiers is really a problem. Yeah. He clearly is embracing it. I just find it so fascinating. I wonder if he has an expectation that others should also. Mm, I don't get that sense yeah. from him at all. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I wonder, you know, you're saying that these are these are drawn in, inspired by American comics. Um, when I look at these, they really remind me of British comics. Yeah. And I'm wondering, was there like a conduit? Because I grew up reading. Yeah. I grew up in the 1960s and 70s. Sure. And British comics, and this looks like. That. Sure, for sure. Um, there's not as you know. 
<clears throat> something I didn't mention is that a lot of um, uh, American and also French comics are getting translated into these uh, young men's magazines in the 1960s. <clears throat> and you know, I didn't mention, but like you know, Barbarella is, has kind of a it's an underground hit in Japan. I don't think it's issued in book form much later. But it's in a magazine called Playboy, and I say called Playboy because it's disconnected with the Hugh Hefner enterprise. Um, so you have things like that, but I don't know of any. I know what you're saying about the British, the look, right? Yeah. But um, I don't know of any British comics translated, and I don't. I don't know how they would be imported into Japan. You know, because. American culture being, you know, the culture of Hollywood and American pop culture, there's a desire, like an, a strong Ameri desire for Americana in Japan. But after, and also, you know, American troops are in Japan, so they're like reading matter gets dumped on the Japanese market. But the, Brit but the British stuff, I don't know of any. This was the time of the British invasion and Carnaby Street. No, kind of sure. So fashion was a big thing. I mean, I read girls' magazines, but yeah. boys' magazines too. And and fashion was a big thing. But that that style, like the panelings, the yeah. shading. No, Brit British fashion features were definitely all over the place, right? You know, and of course, like 007 is seen as right. connected to that world. But I haven't seen any examples of British comics. Okay. No. Um, so you were saying at one point that uh, Monkey Punch had been inspired by like Mad Magazine mm -hmm. or Drucker did uh, Baron did he look at um, like American comedic comic because like in the the long lanky big joint yeah. I can see people like Jack Davis uh, and yeah. stuff so did he read any of the American humor? Yeah I think it's also coming out of that side too because a lot of them you know the more Drucker of course it's different because it's you know, more Drucker and Monkey Punch picks up on the has a like, bobble head on top of the the slim body, right? Um, but it's all about these kind of like lanky bodies, which I think in, at the time would have been read as kind of like white bodies, you know, in Japan. I think that kind of bottom is kind of generally working in that in New Mad Magazine, um, but he doesn't ape it quite in the same way that Monkey Punch does. I mean, there's also you know another artist that's a good example is. Um, Kamimura Kazuo, who did Lady Snowblood. You know, by the time he's doing that kind of work in the 70s, it becomes like hyper japanesque right? But he was doing kind of Mort Drucker parodies also in the late 1960s. That's how his style works. And here, him, not, even more so than, even more so than Baron Yoshimoto, you kind of see the process of like bringing in kind of an American influence and then running, after a couple of years, running madly the other way, where it looks hyper Japanese, right? Like very flat forms, in, and then intentionally kind of incorporating ukiyo-e, like floating world print elements into the work. Yeah. But uh, you know, Baron Yoshimoto, I think his main American comic uh, reference, um, he was looking, you know, he liked, he said his first American comic that he liked a lot was not just Popeye, but the uh, Les Miserables issue of Classics Illustrated. So if you think of him interested in that kind of American comic book look, I think this makes much more sense, right? That, that comic has a lot of full figure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, I know that uh, comic artists like uh, Hiroki, uh, Hirohiko uh, Araki actually kind of have like a similar like thing with like a, you know thing with fashion. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if like uh, if this artist himself might have had some influence on like his work in the world. Uh, it seemed like they both tend to follow along with, like, yeah. what is, uh, what is, like, within, like, you know, men's fashion and whatnot, and, uh, also, like, with the poses. Sure. And, uh, you know, what, what, I guess, at the timeline when it was made, like, what, what is popular. Yeah. No, it's, it's a good question. I hadn't thought about kind of how JoJo maps into this, but, yeah. Um, I don't know much about him other than having read the comics, but yeah, it's a good thing to look into. Thank you. But yeah. Even to take a totally different example, Emma, which is like all about men's haberdashery. Mm -hmm. There's like all these like it's it's you know, it's the opposite of this, but there are all these details of cufflinks and like the, the pen holders and inkwells on, on yeah. the desk and stuff like that. I mean, it's a feature of a lot of, you know, shoujo and then jose, more so shoujo manga as far back that as the 50s. Yeah, yeah. And that to me is what makes yeah. it, like, like it's become a little bit of a, oh, is this shoujo or seinen? Right. Ah. Yeah, if you're talking about cufflinks, it's yeah. seinen. I mean, but, you know, so it's, for me, what, like, 
Baron's work opens up is that <clears throat> we think of manga for girls and women as being uh, a lot more loose and like crossing genres more and also like you know experimenting with you know crossing experimenting with sexuality and gender in different ways um, also experimenting with panel forms in different ways whereas at this point like boys and men's manga even though there is kind of like the experimental side it's very kind of like locked into certain genres and certain stylizations so I think like Baron's work helps show is that there was kind of like a potential, at least at this point, within even manga for men, of some kind of like breaking up what would have been very strict understanding of what masculinity is within uh, comics and how you represent that, both in the, at the level of physiognomy, but also the paneling structures, etc. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'll look that up too. Anybody else? Yeah. Could you talk about troublemakers? Can I talk about troublemakers? What do you want to know about it? <clears throat> well, here, I'll ask, I'll ask everybody a question. What do, you, what do you guys think about Troublemakers? Have you read it? No, I haven't. How many people have bought it and read it, or just read it? Oh, not that many, only five of you. Well, some of you, a couple more of you have to read it after, after today. Uh, Troublemakers was an experiment in different ways. Uh, one way it was an experiment is that um, there is a lot of manga, gekiga, uh, or related things for men, especially once you hit the 1970s, that are borderline unpublishable or not publishable anywhere outside of Japan, right? Um, so Bar that book actually was, in my mind, uh, that's how I justified my, to myself. I was, it became very interested in the, in the artist, obviously. It was to so kind of like use maybe a mild example to see what kind of like men's mass comics from the 70s could be published in English. And if you've read the material, you know, it's a mix of kind of socially um, sensitive stories. And then I intentionally put in some stories that are uh, sexually fairly ignorant uh, or at least problematic in them. It's kind of like a taste of what comprised men's manga in the 1970s. Because I think especially outside of Japan, one has a very skewed perspective of what manga from that era is, mainly defined by you know, so-called literary or experimental manga. A lot of the gato type stuff has kind of overridden our understanding of what manga was at that time. So my, it was kind of an experiment to see responses to that material, right? And we had to... I don't know if I should say this. No, I won't say it. But um, yeah, so it was that. So it was kind of a mix of like the different types of things that one of the more uh, sensitive artists of that world of kind of like mass published men's comics in the 70s uh, was doing. Right? Does that make sense? It's, it's, it was, for me, it's like it, it was a, it's an it's interesting book. It's like the stuff is very well drawn. It's obviously also well drawn in a kind of a very programmatic uh, fashion. You'll also see that it's, um, the styles change from one story to another story, and the comics only date from about a three or four year period. Um, it's not the most famous of Baron Yoshimoto's work, but you know, when you introduce someone into English, you have to start off with something that fits into 200, 300 pages. And Baron Yoshimoto's most famous work runs into 1,000 pages or more. Um, and so wanted to find something, a, st a short story collection um, that re would represent uh, what he was doing. Yeah. Yeah? Five minutes. Anybody, else, anybody have comments about Troublemakers? Does that satisfy your curiosity about the book? So if you had some pictures, that would be great. I don't have any pictures. Of, just in the beginning. I don't believe I brought any, except from the beginning. Yeah, the one from the, the Koreans and Japan story. Yeah. So, okay, I'll just tell you what the, the, the couple of stories are. The, <clears throat> so the story, that the, the, the Troublemakers, the title comes from a story that's not in the book, um, but I thought it was a good title, and it represented kind of the different characters in the, the book. So the title story is called Eriko's Happiness. It's about a graduating high school student who seduces or is seduced by an older man and then how sh that relationship works 
out and then she passes kind of the man on to her uh, junior at school. So it's kind of like this, you know, in traditionally you talk about shoujo culture, you talk about something called S relationships, like these romantic relationships between upperclassmen and lowerclassmen. So he's kind of like playing with the codes of S relationships, uh, but introducing kind of heterosexuality, like an act of teenage heterosexuality into it. That's like the nice way to put it. It's also kind of a sexploitation manga. Uh, this story you see on the left, as I said before, is about how Koreans, uh, Korean immigrants in Japan, uh, Zainichi, were uh, discriminated against both during the war and after the war. Um, and uh, what are the other stories? There's a story about uh, kind of a very, a story that this thing would be very familiar if you know Tatsumi's work about you know a young man growing up in the countryside moving to Tokyo in the 60s to get a job in a factory and then just not fitting in with the new urban culture in Japan and going bonkers uh, for that reason uh, and then the one story that's kind of stylistically different is from 1966 it's called the black soldier and the girl it's from a kashihon uh, rental book uh, uh, from the late 1960s and it's kind of an early example of a manga artist trying to deal sensitively with issues of race. Um, you can be the judge if it does it well, but compared to um, what most representations of blacks were in manga at the time, which came out of kind of like Tezuka and Ishino Shotaro's kind of very racist Piccaninny type caricatures. He's dealing very proactively and sensi sensitively with race. It's about a black soldier in the European front who gets discriminated against. Um, and also, uh, I mean, it'd be worth doing a full study because Baron does a number of works. You saw one uh, dealing with kind of like black and white relations, some of it, you know, tending on kind of exoticization of black bodies, but also trying to deal with American race relationships. Uh, in an interesting way. And also, that kind of like feeds into this Korean manga as well. At the end, this Korean guy, he um, he gets dissed by this Japanese girl who finds out that he stinks of garlic, which is kind of code for being Korean. Um, but at the end, he sees her 20 years later, and she um, is playing with a kid who looks black. So the the insinuation is that probably later on, she had a relationship with an African-American soldier stationed in United in, in Japan. So but yet she had discriminated in her past against Korea, right? So Baron is kind of like very subtly like kind of comparing racial discrimination issues in Japan um and and United States. So it's, it's a it's a mishmash of issues um and content, high and low. Yeah. So I guess uh that's it. Uh thank you for your questions. I hope you enjoyed the talk and please check out the book up at Retrofit's table. Thank you.